Welcome everyone. Uh, today, this evening, we are truly blessed to have Father Forti um, share with us uh, about the life of St. Fortius uh, as the patron saint of the seminary. If you aren't familiar with his life, uh, he's truly a worthy namesake and inspiration for all of our students um, through his own life uh, prior to uh, becoming a, uh, a clergyman. He was a scholar, uh, but also a very pious uh, and faithful Orthodox Christian. And, and then when called upon to serve the church, he did so with his um, entire life, with dedicating himself wholly to the service of the church. And that's a wonderful model um, for our students, whether they will be called later in life to serve the church or whether or not they'll just stay as uh, lay people. Um, we can all draw from the example that St. Fotios offers us. So with that being said, Father Fotsi, please, we're all very much looking forward to it. Evlogita, your eminence. Uh, Evlogita, fathers. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl wrote, you may be prone to blame me for invoking examples that are the exceptions to the rule. You may, of course, ask whether we really need to refer to saints. It is true that they form a minority. More than that, they always will remain a minority. And yet I see they're in the very challenge to join the minority. For the world is in a bad state, but everything will become still worse unless each of us does his best. I would like to approach the life of St. Fortius precisely from the angle of doing one's best. I will divide the presentation today into three parts. First, I would like to give a brief sketch of St. Fortius's life. Second, I would like to look at the source of meaning for Orthodox Christians. And third, we will look at a model for the pursuit of meaning. St. Photius was born about the year 820. His parents, Sergius and Irene, were nobles, and me, they were exiled by the iconoclasts uh, for their veneration of the icons. So St. Photius spent his early childhood in exile. His parents died from the mistreatment, as did one of his siblings. They are commemorated on the 13th of May. As a youth, St. Photios returned to Constantinople and began, a series, began systematic study. He acquired an incredible breadth of learning, all kinds of subjects, everything from medicine, law, on and on, astronomy, it just goes on. And I won't go through the entire list. I would simply add that this was not a simple intellectual pursuit. We have a letter of his uh, to the Met a Metropolitan whom he healed later on in his life. Um, the Metropolitan was praising St. Photius for his medical skills and thanking him for the healing that he had granted him. So we see that throughout his life, St. Photius was utilizing all these skills that he learned in early childhood. He wanted, to be, 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 he wanted to become a monk. That was his initial goal. He was prevented from doing that by, really by the court, because they saw so, many, so much skill, so much potential in him that they pretty much forced him to be, assume high positions in, in the Byzantine court, which he did. He was a diplomat. He would be sent to Baghdad. Uh, where he fulfilled a very successful mission. And eventually, after the removal of Patriarch Ignatius uh, by imperial decree, St. Photios was unanimously elected patriarch. He was about 40 years old at that time. Now, I would like to focus on this, because St. Ignatius was deposed uh, 
uncanonically. He was deposed by uh, civil authorities. But St. Photius only assumed the patriarchy after he had permission from St. Ignatius. Also, he was quite literally forced by the entire populace to assume the Archbishopric of Constantinople. As patriarch, he was ac absolutely dynamic. He, be he begins with a sort of intellectual and artistic renaissance, the fruits of which we can see even to this day. This m beautiful mosaic is larger than, li uh, larger than life, actually, in Ag the church, great church of Hagia Sophia is from the time of St. Photios. He begins to restore churches desecrated by the iconoclasts, and he also begins apostolic work. He was the one who began the conversion of the Slavs. In fact, in fact, the Russians in their old manuscripts <coughs> attribute the conversion of the Slavs to St. Photios. And he was the one who was the first to, he instituted the first bishop in Kiev. After about 10 years of being patriarch, the new Emperor Basil and the former Patriarch Ignatius dethroned St. Photios in the Sham Synod. We are now at, in 869. Before we move on, this beautiful mosaic in the apse of the Hagia Sophia is also from the time of St. Photios. When St. Photios was deposed in the Sham Synod, this was the single worst capitulation of the Church of Constantinople to the Pope of Rome. Even the false Council of Ferrara Florence did not compromise in, turn to, in terms of subjection to the Pope as much as the Ignatian party did. In effect, they gave the, they gave the Pope free control to do whatever he would like in the Church. And of course, it was a kind of pact, a sort of pact with the devil because they gave the Pope control and by that they legitimized their dethroning of St. Photios. Now, in a fit of passion, characterized by resentment, in violation of many canons of the church, they used the Pope's ambitions for, the, for their own petty goals and that was not all. In their extremism, after having confined St. Photios to, the, to a dungeon, they demolished churches which St. Photios had built because they considered his election, well, without grace. They also debased themselves to torturing patients in the hospitals which St. Photios personally tended. They did this, as Symphotius pointed out, in order to hit, hurt him on a very personal level. Of course, they tortured Symphotius as well. So at this time, Symphotius won his second crown of confession, the first one being in his youth for the sake of the icons. And that is why he's called the confessor. Now, granted, the majority of the bishops and clergy and faithful of Constantinople did not follow Patriarch Ignatius. Patriarch Ignatius had a hard time getting any following in Constantinople, actually. And that is because St. Photius was firm in his resolve. He pointed out to the Ignatians that they had fallen away from the Apostolic Church that they had lapsed. Now, St. Photius was not going to back down, and he was not going to flatter the Pope in, in the Pope's conceits. And he was not about to give way to St. Ignatius and Patriarch Ignatius' violations of the canons. And so St. Photius endures years of confinement and, and torture. Uh, it was at this time that St. Photius wrote a rather lengthy le letter to Emperor Basil 
complaining mostly about two things. Now, you understand that he was starved. Uh, they inflicted a lot of punishment on his body. But two things particularly troubled him. The first was isolation. He deeply missed uh, his acquaintances, his monastic, the monastics, his clergy. And in, with a tinge of humor, he said that I'm not even allowed mediocre singers to listen to in the prison. And the other point was the matter of books. And he literally goes on for a few pages about this matter. He showed Emperor Basil that even Nestorius, even Arius, the heretics, were not deprived of their books when they were sent into exile. And he brought all kinds of proofs. In it, he also makes an interesting point that um, kind of shows us his view on his knowledge of the legal system because he cites Roman law and how it, it is being violated. The punishment meted out to St. Photius, he shows, is not in accordance to any crime. Of course, there is no crime. And especially, he wasn't a heretic. When he asked what kind of heresy did they commit, all the Ignatius could say was, well, you're a servant of Satan. That's worse than any heresy. Patriarch Ignatius's tenure, which was about 10 years, was sad. He tried to undo whatever St. Photius had built up. He forbade the iconographers to paint icons because they were from St. Photius' time. And he could not even, because of the stance he took, and because of the agreement with the pope, all the readers in the diocese, he could not ordain any one of them. He closed himself off in a bit of a box because if he said uh, what he said, that any mysteries completed by St. Photius are totally invalid, that means that even none of the ordinations are valid. So ultimately, he shot himself in the foot because he didn't have a clergy to go on, uh, to, to uh, well, to support him. In any case, after a few years, the emperor, Basil, and Patriarch Ignatius himself had a change of heart, realizing that they had made a mess of things. St. Photius was recalled to Constantinople and given a teaching position, which he enjoyed very much. He also became a tutor for the emperor's children. He then proceeded to reconcile with St. Ignatius, the patriarch. After all the maltreatment, the two patriarchs fell down at each other's feet and asked each other's forgiveness. St. Ignatius, and I would point out, in an act of deep humility, took St. Photius as his advisor, and both of them became close friends. In fact, on his deathbed, St. Ignatius commended all of his close, close ones to St. Photius's care. Let me in interject something here. The Ignatian schism had the potential to become a catastrophic event for the church. Similar situations in church history, when civil authorities, uh, when civil authorities uh, would exile a bishop, would often cause schisms that would last for, last for almost a century. And yet, with St. Photius' firmness, and yet his extreme forbearance, he put an end to division in the church. And I might add that his forgiveness of wrongs was absolutely complete. In subsequent when years, when people wanted to talk about the maltreatment he endured, he said, he would say, that's, in, that's enough. We do not need to bring these things up. And he deeply venerated St. Ignatius. In fact, he was the one who promoted his status as a confessor of the faith. Following the death of St. Ignatius, St. Photius, despite his reservations, was reinstated as patriarch. He lo lost no time in convening a major synod. 
the Eighth Ecumenical Synod. This was truly St. Fortius's triumph. The synod counteracted the idea of papal supremacy and the heretical addition of the filioque clause to the symbol of faith. These are the two foundational principles of the Western rebellion against the church. I might add also that the famed canonist Valsamon considers even the first synod of St. Fortius, the first, second synod as ecumenical, simply because of the authority that St. Fortius gave with his exceptional, exceptional insight. I might also add that the synods which St. Fortius convened were the size of ecumenical synods. And this was very purposeful because he brought back ecumenicity to the Ca Constantinopolitan church. What I mean is this, with the rise of the Muslims and as the empire is shrinking, there was a tendency to become more localized in, in, in their views. And St. Photios made sure that the entire church is involved when making decisions. So even when making decisions against the Pope, against his interference in the Church of Constantinople, St. Photios calls all the patriarchates together. He says, a bishop is acting in violation of the canons in regards to me. That means we are going to get together and take care of this problem together. And that's why his, his synods are of such value. I might add that we do not have the acts, the original acts of the first, second synod, which is a tragedy. They were burned by the extremist party of the Ignatians. It's a tragedy because in it were addressed the questions of lawful resistance to a hierarch, what constitutes lawful resistance to a hierarch, when is it lawful, meaning heresy, and when is it not. It was directed against the minority who was rebelling against St. Photios and his, and his election. It, it's sad because a synod bears the stamp of the fathers, and we lost a precious, precious document, uh, which, would, would, which would give us an insight uh, um, in the mind of St. Saint, Saint Fortius on, on this critical issue, especially at our, at our time. In any case, um, thank God we have other writings of his. Eventually, after the Eighth Ecumenical Synod, St. Fortius was exiled a second time, where he reposed. Now, St. Fortius' life was one of one long dedication of every power of his being, of every gift, intellectual and spiritual, to the glory and unity of the church. But we turn to our times, and we see a sad spectacle. I often hear from our youth this question, why do we need to study our faith? Can we not just live our faith? Initially, the question caught me somewhat by surprise. I found it a bit astonishing. The Holy Fathers, the greatest minds and, spir and spiritual heroes, spent their entire lives plumbing the depths of divine wisdom, while we ask, why, why, do, we need to study, why do I need to study my faith? Furthermore, if we wish to pursue a certain career, we know that we need to put in some time learning a science or trade. As for the science of sciences, the art of perf perfecting ourselves, the salvation of the soul, we ask, why do I need to study that? Or, just live your faith. If that is an honest statement, then fine. But I'm afraid that most of the time it is simply an excuse. It is a symptom that for the most part, as Orthodox, we do not assign the church the proper meaning in our lives. There are many exceptions to this, including those of you in the room tonight because I see your efforts in coming here as proof of your search for meaning in life. But by and large, Orthodox have come to see the church as a place you go on weekends in order to fulfill your moral obligations and get a sense of community, and that in the best of cases. That is a good start, but if one were to suggest something more, a greater dedication, the response is bewilderment. One of my students told me the story of how somebody asked her, you study at a seminary? Why? What, 
Why? I have a suggestion. Though we live in a heliocentric solar system, we also live in a Christocentric universe. Or rather, we live in a universe penetrated through and through with Christ, the Son of Righteousness. Everything that exists finds its meaning in Christ. Without Christ, nothing has meaning. To exist and turn away from existence, that is Christ, is meaningless. In fact, it is demonic. But most Christians would agree with me on this and say, of course, Christ is central to my life. To this I would answer, if that is the case, then you should have no qualms about dedicating your life to the service of the church, which is Christ's body. But here is where things get uncomfortable because the church on earth is not made up of saints, but of those striving for sanctity. The church is persecuted from within and without. Persecutions from unbelievers can be harsh, but the divisions which arise within the church are the most hurtful. Not only that, there is first and foremost the inner struggle fought on the battleground of the human heart, which is split between good and evil. So when you get down to the grid of it, life in the church is a great struggle. To assume responsibility for, for our own failings and also the failings of others, and to bear with them. We want to shirk that responsibility. But therein lies the mistake. We forget that in the words of St. Justin of Celia, in all respects, the organism of the church is the most complex known to man. Why? Because it is a unique theanthropic organism in which all divine and human mysteries and all divine and human powers constitute one body. The church is the most perfect organization because it is the most perfect organism, the, the, the theanthrop theanthropic organism. God and man are united in it in a spirit-inspired and grace-filled theanthropic organism. God lives in and through man, and man lives in and through God. So if we have confined ourselves to the proverbial cave in which we only see the dim light at the entrance, how will we extricate ourselves from this cave and come to enjoy the beautiful vision of the many-lighted heaven of the church which shines a guiding light on all who believe. If we have established that Christ and his Holy Church are the ultimate meaning in our life, how do we go about pursuing that meaning? I cannot answer that question. Each of us has to answer it individually, for life is too varied and much prayer, counsel, and enlightenment are necessary. And in fact, I am not qualified to answer such a question, seeing that I do not think that I even have begun the real pursuit of meaning. But I have an ideal, and that is of paramount importance. St. Elizabeth, the Grand Duchess of Russia, always used to say, you have to have an ideal in life. So I suggest we look to the saints who set a standard for perfection who show us clearly how far we are from doing our best. If we do not reach the standard, at least we will have pushed ourselves a little harder. And if we do not reach the high mark, the humility we gain from it, according to St. John of the Ladder, might be even better for us than achieving the high goal. So I would like to present two examples. The first is for parents because they are the ones who need to guide the youth on the meaningful path of existence. And I am afraid that all too often, the salvation of the soul is not the first and foremost co concern in the minds of parents as, as they raise their children. And so, example one. In the early 320s, as St. Constantine was giving the church unprecedented advantages, there was still a very localized persecution being carried out by Licinius in the east, Asia Minor. Near the town of Sevasti, 40 soldiers were forced to stand in a freezing lake throughout the night in the middle of a fierce winter for refusing to deny Christ. After this ordeal, the holy martyrs had their feet broken with rods by the torturers and most expired at this point. 
Then the torturers began to load the bodies of the martyrs onto carts in order to transport them for burning because they did, they did not want the faithful to venerate their relics. Only one of the martyrs did not have his feet broken, a handsome youth named Melito. The governor took pity on him and allowed the torturers not to break his bones, but to let him live. At this point, he was in a state of shock from the cold. Seeing this, the mother of this martyr lifted her son and threw him on one of the carts, saying, Go also, my beloved boy, with your fellow martyrs, lest you abide in impiety, God forbid, or remain the only one without a crown. Even at this last moment, temptation comes. Endure the fire also, as you withstood the cold, that you might partake of everlasting joy. First, after watching her child be tortured all night long, instead of kissing her son and caressing him, which would be totally natural and even pious, she lifted the body of her son, ran after the cart, and threw him like a sack on top of the pile of bodies, knowing that he was the only one who would be burned alive, since the other ones were already dead. If I know a thing or two about mothers, the pain that Saint Melito felt during the tortures was nothing in comparison to the pain his mother felt as she conquered nature. Saint Romanos the Melodist confirms this by ranking the mother of Saint Melito along with the 40 martyrs. But reflect on this. Her son did not deny Christ. The executioners simply took pity on him. Licinius was soon to be defeated in battle by St. Constantine and the peace of the church inaugurated. This woman, who was a widow, could have her only son as a consolation in life. In fact, it would be a great consolation because he would be a confessor. This would not be the first of such incidents in the church either. But that was not the best course of action. She trampled down false pathological love and was first and foremost concerned about the salvation of her child's soul. This is true love. The second example. And we can all draw inspiration from it because it is so superb. The second example is from the time of Decius's persecution in the year 251. This persecution caught many Christians off guard. Unfortunately, having grown lax during a prolonged time of peace, many of them denied Christ. But in the town of Catania, which is located at the foot of Mount Etna in Sicily, the holy martyr Agatha, whose memory, whose memory we celebrate today, endured horrible tortures for the sake of Christ. Among them this, and I quote from the Synaxarion, The governor directed his impious servants to remove the holy Agatha's breasts with iron tools. The executioners tried to remove her breasts for a long time as they twisted them with tongs. However, they were not able to remove them since the young maiden was still small-breasted. Whereupon those savage men carved them out of her chest with knives, the sight of which would cause profound sorrow to any witness. The hemorrhaging was so profuse that all the ground about her was reddened with blood. I want to point out that St. Agatha had it all. She was extraordinarily beautiful. She had wealth and lands, and she was of the nobility. But she vowed her virginity to God and remained steadfast amid tortures, preferring nothing to Christ and his holy church. She simply did her absolute best. And so, I think the words of St. Sergius the Confessor formerly the Father Mitrofan, spiritual father of the Saints Martha and Mary convent in Moscow, I think his words are appropriate. This is what he says about saints. Strengthen yourself by their example and dismiss forever your empty usual excuses for idleness. But they were saints while we are sinners and weak. No, they were not saints. They became saints thanks to their faith, love, and ascetic struggle. But let us return to the foothills of Mount Etna in California. 
I cannot help but feel boundless joy as we celebrate the feast of our beloved patron, patron St. Photios. He endured tortures as the best of martyrs, for which he is called the confessor. He forgave his tortures and made them his friends. He healed divisions in the church. I would like to emphasize this, that St. Photios suffered most from misguided members of the church. He serves as a perfect model for us because he leaves us no excuse for becoming cynical in the face of divisions that try to sunder the unity of the church. He converted the Slavs, but not just the Slavs. Muslims converted to Orthodoxy simply on hearing of his virtues. Armenian Monophysites returned to the bosom of the church because of him. For all of this, the church bestows yet another appellation on him, the equal to the apostles. He checked the rebellion of Western Christendom right at its roots. He clearly showed and warned the West what the roots of its downfall were. His intellectual accomplishments win him the admiration of scholars to the present day. The efficacy and height of his deifying noetic prayer were proven by his face shining like that of the prophet Moses when he prayed. But especially, church historians simply are in awe of the way St. Photius handled a most difficult situation in the church. Divisions from within, divisions from without, interference of civil powers in matters of the church, the list goes on. And he did it all so perfectly. There is only one conclusion to which they come. The church needed desperately as St. Photius. The church needed someone who would do his absolute best. Not what was convenient, not what was easy, but what was best. St. Photios is a uniquely great saint who dedicated, dedicated every fiber of his being to the service of the church, to the service of Christ. And I repeat that I feel boundless joy as I contemplate the miracle of our seminary. The miracle of St. Photios still working in the church, uniting its members, and giving us an arena in which we can strive to do our best, a, a refuge for those pursuing meaning in life. I thank you for your patience and ask your forgiveness.